Okay, good evening, everybody. If I can have everyone's attention, I'd like to call to order our yes. meeting tonight, the East Long Meadow School Committee meeting. It's October 16th, 2017, and it is 6 p.m. As a reminder, this meeting is being both audio and videotaped. I just ask if anyone else is doing to let us know, please. Okay, and with that, if we can all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Perfect. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I just want to let you know we have a big group here for us. So when I start roll call, it's actually going to be starting over here in the little front seat over here. So, Allie, starting with you. Gregory Thompson. Deirdre Mayu. Valerie Anier, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. Gordon Smith, Superintendent of Schools. Kathy Saletti, Recording Secretary. Excellent. And at this point, I'd like to um, just mention that we're at number two here, and it's the open public hearing on citizens' request through petition. So I just want to go through my little script that I have to read in accordance to our Mass General Law. So again, I just want to thank everyone for being here this evening, and this public hearing has been scheduled in accordance with Article 8, Section 2 of the Town of East Long Meadow Home Room Charter. This hearing was scheduled because of a citizen's petition that was filed seeking to make the successful completion of a course in American government slash civics a graduation requirement of East Long Meadow High School. We do have an agenda for today's hearing, which is in writing and of which everyone could have a copy. If you didn't get one, they're right up there. We're going to be proceeding according to that agenda. We're going to hear first from the Superintendent Smith, who's going to provide an overview of the current social studies sequence of courses for the East Long Meadow Public School students. We will then hear from, well, excuse me, we will then have a presentation from the representative of the citizen who filed the petition. Okay. After this presentation, there'll be an opportunity for visitors to address the committee. I do have a sign-up sheet. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to sign it, that's okay. I will still open it up if there's, you know, on the time. Okay. Uh, during all these presentations, committee members will have an opportunity to ask questions so that the committee can have all the relevant facts that should be evaluated before reaching a decision on this petition. The committee appreciates everyone for being here to provide information and opinions on this very important subject. So now what I'll do at this point is turn it over to Mr. Smith for the initial overview. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Mayu, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a Monday evening to discuss with us something very important, our program of studies, and specifically this evening, program of studies <coughs> specific to social science and history. Um, at the table up front here, which I think most people picked up um, agendas, which Ms. Mayu just mentioned, there also is a handout. Uh, school committee asked me to be brief, so I have just one slide, but I couldn't get all the information on that one slide, so the handout is a two-sider. Um, which you may want to pick up if you haven't had a chance to pick up. But just quickly to, up on the big screen here to walk you through currently what we do in the secondary grades, which would be 6th grade through 12th grade. Our social studies curriculum in 6th grade, we offer ancient history and ancient civilization. So that would be looking at early humans, rise of civilization, ancient civilizations such as Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, and China. Uh, then in seventh grade, we work on world geography. So we're working on not only geography skills, but emphasizing physical and political geography around the world. Then in eighth grade, we have civics, which covers citizenship and government. Um, big units would be citizenship, government, roots of American democracy, US Constitution, the three branches of our government, Bill of Rights and specific Supreme Court cases. Then moving into the high school grades, ninth grade, most of our students take world history now. That's a recent addition to the program of studies just a few years ago. Then we have graduation requirements in 10th and 11th, U.S. History 1 and U.S. History 2. 
those are the current graduation requirements um, within that are specific to social studies uh, although students should be taking three years of social studies then in 12th grade we offer a variety of elective courses and students might take AP government um, that's advanced placement government advanced placement psychology advanced placement US history psychology contemporary issues and African American studies those are the electives currently in our social studies program of studies a couple points to um, keep in mind K through 12 all our offerings in social studies um, are aligned with the part the current Department of Elementary and Secondary Education history and social science frameworks and standards um, another key item for all of us that are ELPS employees and the school committee is that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is currently undertaking a revision of those social science and history frameworks. Um, that time frame was originally that where we might have had a draft come out somewhere around December or January of this year. People may know that Commissioner Chester um, passed away last spring and that has uh, seemingly delayed. We haven't seen a timetable, a current timetable for when those uh, frameworks and draft of standards will be coming out. On the other side, just some key points around our social studies classes at the high school. We are following a sequence of courses that the department recommends. Basically that world history to US history one and two to electives in the senior year that's a, a recommended sequence. Interestingly, at least the current frameworks reach down to eighth grade. So as they look at sort of what high school students are doing um, and moving through a pathway, they do count that eighth grade course in their um, recommended pathways. Each year, approximately nine sections of world history uh, are being offered to freshmen. That's a long block semester course. People are aware of our schedule. We still have spots for the longer blocks, and we have spots in a, a given day for shorter periods of roughly 45 minutes. Um, U.S. History 1, we also offer approximately nine sections, um, which again is a long block semester course. And U.S. History 2, we would offer that to juniors and it would approximately be nine sections. That's based on our current enrollment. Obviously, that's subject to change. Um, and then electives such as AP US government, that's a full year course. AP US history is a semester course. AP psychology is a full year course. Um, psychology and contemporary issues in American studies, I believe, are also full year. I'm going to look to the high school semester, semester courses. Um, this year, contemporary issues seems to be the most popular elective as it has the most sections um, for at least the 2017-2018 school year. So that gives you just a quick overview of the pathway that our students going through their freshman um, and senior year are taking right now. Um, it also gives you an idea of what's going on in 6th, 7th, and 8th. With that, I'll turn it back over to Mrs. Mayu, the chairperson of the school committee. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so moving on, we now will have Mr. Harrigan come up for a presentation of your request, please. Good evening to Superintendent Smith, Principal Dr. Flanagan, school committee members, parents, students, and citizens of East Long Meadow. My name is Michael J. Harrigan. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important issue. Our intent is not to diminish the many activities now being done at the school, but to add to what can be done. In a democracy, the most important office is the office of citizen in the words of Thomas Jefferson. The most important activity of citizenship is to be informed and active voter. 
At the present time, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, two-thirds of high school seniors do not understand the fundamentals of our government or the role citizens play in it. According to Eric Lesser, our senator, we have been missing a vital component of our students' education, the role schools play in educating our citizens. How can students be expected to make wise decisions regarding who will represent them in state, local, and national governments when so many know so little about how our government works? If students lack a basic understanding of our system of government, they're not likely to participate in the process as adults. At the present time, less than 20% of students at East Long Meadow High School take AP government. These students know government. What about the other 80%? We can do better. I have been an advisor in this school for Model Congress. I reinstituted it. No one else was interested. There's been three successful years at American International College in the Model Congress program. We finally did get a teacher, not a social studies teacher, a math teacher. I volunteered for voter registration sessions the past four years in this school. A regular topic of conversation in these sessions is American government. Our students do not have a strong background in the mechanics of, of American government. The most recent election in our town, there were 924 eligible voters in the, uh, in the ages of 18 to 24. Only 66 voted. 66 out of 924. 7%, and that included in the, the issue of marijuana and a young person from their own age group that was running for office. Connecticut, among other states, requires a half-year course in American government slash civics as a condition of graduation. The result is an increase in voter registration, voter participation, and active citizenship for that 18 to 24-year-old age group. A course in American government is a training ground for active citizenship. The course could include the theory and practice of our constitutional democracy, rights and responsibilities of the individuals, News literacy, the Senator Lesser just called for. Political ethics, understanding political issues, critical thinking, problem solving, and local government. Right now, local government is not taught in this school. I made the arrangements for speakers to come in. Tom Florence, Kevin Manley, Eric Lesser. Very few questions. I think there was one question. The students did not have a background. They should know what our new charter is. They should know the workings of government. Uh, <clears throat> we should focus on American government to show students that it's so important. Our government has an impact on all aspects of our lives. Justice is not done to the major concepts of democracy in a scattered approach. It should stand alone. We should give our democratic system the attention it deserves. We can do better. A text is not necessary for a course in American government. Civics Renewal Network, which aims to improve the civic education, includes the Library of Congress, National Archives, the Kennedy Institute for the US Senate, and the Civics Project headed by Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Its website has over 1,000 high qualified educational resources. They can only be used to their full potential in an American government class. Citizen knowledge and participation is the foundation of any democracy. I opened the testimony tonight by observing the words of Thomas Jefferson. In a democracy, the most important office is the office of citizen. The most important activity is to be an informed and active voter. The best route to inform students and stimulate voter participation and participation in our process, which could be a lifelong learning experience, is to take an American government course required for all students. Thank you for your attention.
right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is have an opportunity for visitors to address the committee. Um, we did have a sign-in sheet. I will initially go by that sign-in sheet. If you didn't get a chance to sign in, I'll just let other people come up if they want to. Did you have? Oh, I thought you said something. Okay. All right, so the first one on my list, uh, Katie Roeder. Is she still here, Katie? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I had to mention something, which I apologize for. Katie, you can still come up. I'm just going to read as you come up. Um, I just want to talk about this time where we have the opportunity for visitors to address the committee. Just so we all understand what's involved during this time, I just want to read a little paragraph. It's an opportunity for statements to be made. The chair may direct a member or the superintendent to respond to a question or issue that may be presented. Speakers will have three minutes to present their material. And I just want to let you know, I'll give you like a little hand signal when we're coming up on those three minutes. Improper conduct and remarks will not be allowed. Defamatory or abusive communication, verbal or written, are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or remarks, the chairman shall terminate the individual's privilege of address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints of school personnel or complaints against any member of the school community. Under most circumstances, administrative channels are the proper means for disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. So I just had to get that out there. Sorry about that. It's okay. So again, just three minutes, whatever you want to say into the mic. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katie Roeder, and I am a current senior at East Longmeadow High School. If you ask anyone who knows me, they will say that I'm a dedicated student in and out of the classroom, and that I participate in way too many school activities to be healthy. I transferred to ELHS my sophomore year. I moved across country from Utah to here, Western Mass, halfway through my freshman year. But before attending ELHS, my parents sent me to Cathedral High School to finish my freshman year. So in total, I've attended three different high schools. Now that I've settled in ELHS, I've taken as many advanced courses as my schedule will allow, and I strive for success in each one of them. I'm a dedicated student, and I participate in many clubs and organizations. So with that in mind, you might find it a shock that I'm barely able to graduate this year. Not because of my grades, but because of the way my credits transferred and the requirements that ELHS already has, um, and because of the unflexible schedule. Adding another requirement for civics, a requirement that's already fulfilled by eighth grade requirements and an elective course, um, would put other students in my situation and take away their ability to pursue their interests and rob them of the opportunity to explore new areas of learning. As it is, I've had to sacrifice the opportunity to take several AP courses and classes that I know will help in my future courses of study. I have already had to give up AP Biology in order to take a class that I have already taken at a different school. And it's not just me who has to sacrifice classes in order to graduate. If we add a civics requirement, it will lower the number of electives that students can take and creates a tighter schedule with little room for exploration. I know so many students who cannot take the classes that they want to take. Sadly, the schedule has forced too many students already to drop their electives to take classes that they're told that they need to graduate. And school can be hard enough for students to want to attend willingly. Imagine how much harder it will be for them to want to go to school knowing that they don't get to take the classes that they enjoy or the classes they have chosen for themselves. Not only that, but adding the requirement will add so much more stress and pressure on students. I know this from experience that I personally need a break from my academics during the school day. Last year, I challenged myself to taking AP Calculus with Honors Chemistry and Honors English. And if I didn't have an elective such as orchestra to break up those classes, I wouldn't have made it through junior year with my grades intact. Electives aren't just an opportunity to learn um, things other than academics. It also affords students a chance to give their brains a break and relax, and even to have fun. Um, am I running out of time? You have about a minute. Oh, sorry, OK. And uh, taking away those electives by adding civics requirements would be detrimental to a student's mental health, um, a topic that we stress in our Spartan block or our assembly classrooms. Um, so you tell me that we have to avoid stress um, but how can we do that if you are the one that are giving us the stress? And I understand how important it is to have civics, especially in today's world. Um, and there's many other students who feel that adding another requirement will just make it way too much for us. Um, and adding this requirement um, will not necessarily teach us about it. There will be students who will not pay attention in this class because it is a requirement. It's something they don't want to take. Um, it's like you say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, so, um, yeah. 
And I know that from talking with other students, um, I haven't heard personally one student say that they're in favor of this. Um, they say that it's unfair, we have too many as it is, and I don't want any other students fearing for their um, ability to graduate as I have. It is one of the worst feelings in the world, I can personally tell you, and no one should have to feel that way. And I don't want to hear another student say or complain or break down over the fact that they might not be able to graduate. Um, and it's awful that that has to happen. Okay, thank you very much. Sam Leone. Good evening. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sam Leone and I'm a junior here at ELHS. First of all, I would like to thank both sides of the argument for being here tonight. Regardless of how you stand, we sincerely appreciate you expressing yourselves and getting involved in tonight's hearing. However, with all due respect, look around. Very few students are here because not only do very few bother to find out about our public functions, but even more so that those who do are completely indifferent. If so few young people are here tonight to support either side of a topic that will affect them personally one way or another, why do we expect them to show up to vote? The schools do serve a higher purpose, to prepare students for the rest of their lives, to craft them into responsible individuals and to teach them beyond requirements of Common Core. We can put East Long Meadow Public Schools at the forefront of a meaningful education, an education that allows its students to be aware of the government they live under. They should know the significance of staying informed, reading the news, and if they don't like what they see, how to change it. Civics is the answer. In the 2017 municipal election, just 7% of registered voters between the ages of 18 and 24 bothered showing up to the polls. That's dismal. I like to think that we can do better. One way to increase political participation is a civics course in the high school. While the eighth grade course may be sufficient to meet certain standards, bluntly put, a civics course matters far less to a 13-year-old than it would to a high school student. High school students, especially upperclassmen, are driving, working, and if they're not already eligible to vote, they will be soon. Government and politics pertains to people in this age group far more than it does middle schoolers. Most of your concerns are relevant, but this proposal includes only one key element, that a civics education course is required for high school students. The school committee's autonomy elsewhere is preserved and encouraged in regards to when and how it is established. There are ways to enact a civics course so that students don't have any more required courses, just that they're taught at a more appropriate time. Civics in high school matters because students are more mature. They should not just be told that their government is important, but fully appreciate why their government is important. To not only be aware of how to participate, but to be incentivized and emboldened to seek participation individually. To not only know, but to care. It is undeniable that people care more when it affects them personally. This is why civics is so much more effective at a later age. Potential for these schools to produce role model, conscious voters exists. It's only a matter of pursuing it. Thank you. Thank you. I have Michael W. Harrigan. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, Principal Dr. Flanagan, school committee members, teachers, students, and community members from East Lamento. My name is Michael W. Harrigan, 1987 graduate of East Lamento High School. It gives me great pleasure to speak in support of the petition for a course in American government and civics for all students at East Lamento High School, and also for my father's background in the subject. Michael J. Harrigan, as you know, spearheaded this peti petition, and I would like to take a moment to speak about the background for which he speaks. Michael Harrigan's experience includes 42 years of teaching government-related courses. During that time, voter registration and voter participation were both twice the national average. It's a direct link to the student's formal study of American government and civics 
at East Windsor High School where he taught. Furthermore, he became an instructional leader in American government and civics in other venues, including le leading seminars at the state capitol and leading seminars for social studies educators across the state. As a result of his knowledge and efforts, Michael Harrigan was recognized for exemplary citizenship education by the Connecticut General Assembly, by the University of Connecticut for excellence in education, and by the Close-Up Foundation for Government Studies. He speaks with years of experience in the field, and he knows firsthand the immense value of American government and civics in students' lives, both present and future. In closing, a good American government and civics course for all students helps leads to their lifetime learning and engagement in the democratic political process. I observe this regularly myself as a result of the civics course that I taught on the high school level. It's crucial for building an informed citizenry. Thus, I urge the school committee to find in favor of instituting an American government and civics course for all students at my alma mater, East Long Meadow High School. Thank you very much. Timothy Allen. Hi, everybody. So I'm Tim Allen. I'm the principal at Birchton Park Middle School. Thank you, everybody, for coming and engaging in this important discussion. Um, I just have a couple quick things to say. Um, I think everybody knows that we offer civics to our eighth graders, um, to all of our eighth graders. We have a flow at the middle school level, like Superintendent Smith talked about, where we go from ancient civilization to geography to civics. Um, we feel at the middle school that this is a very nice flow of understanding where sort of where civilization came from is sixth grade and then sort of how civilization interacts with the geography of the world in seventh and then how we function as a civilization here in American democracy in eighth. Uh, I'm a big believer in the importance of middle school in a lot of different ways and that belief I think infuses this conversation as well. Um, the young adolescent mind and the young adolescent brain are in a developmental stage that's only equaled by infancy um, for how much they're taking in and how much they're changing. Um, and that happens at the middle school level. Um, therefore, when I arrived here from 12 years of education in other places, I was so excited to hear that we taught civics at eighth grade because I think it's a very impressionable age, I think it's a very developmental age, and I think it's an age when students are sort of taking in a lot of different ideas and perspectives and at that time sort of deciding who they are. I see a lot of my students, a couple or at least one of them has already spoke today, and um, even just after a year or two in the high school, they're so much older and so much more established. And I think that there's a lot of value in teaching something as important as civics in the eighth grade when they're in such a developmental and impressionable age. Um, every eighth grader gets civics, as we talked about, and our civics curriculum is always evolving. Certainly in the last few years, it has evolved a lot. And in the last three years, um, we've hired two new civics teachers. Um, so we've hired people very excited to teach this content, very into it, and they're making the curriculum their own um, as we speak, which is wonderful. But uh, again, in the eighth grade, the civics curriculum just leads to many deep conversations. It leads to a lot of critical thinking. It leads to a lot of argumentative writing. Um, and all of the above just make it so important for eighth graders, as well as we tie it to current events. So it's not an isolated curriculum. It's, it's a curriculum that then ties to current events weekly. So I agree with everything that's been said as far as the importance goes, but I think East Long Meadow has done a great job making sure that all 230 or 40 this year um, eighth graders are getting civics and uh, getting it in a focused one year full course every day, 180 sessions. Uh, and I think it's a great time to give it in the eighth grade. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Torsha. Hi, 
My name is uh, Jonathan Torsha, uh, and it feels weird to say this, but I am an alum uh, 2017. Uh, so that's the first time I've ever had to say that. But, um, but I first want to uh, start off uh, in my remarks thanking the East Long Meadow School Committee uh, for having this opportunity that is open to the public. Uh, um, since I was in elementary school, personally, I've always had a fascination about American civics. While in the East Long Meadow public school system, I was very involved in the local political process inside and outside the school system. Uh, I was involved with the creation of Model Congress, along with Michael Harrigan, uh, as well as reviving debate team uh, in serving in student government as uh, the president of my class. I, during this time, I also had a goal in mind to try and make sure that students' interests were, were heard uh, when it came to very important issues, uh, making sure that their voices uh, uh, were heard during, during different um, issues. Uh, right now in this country, we are at an all-time low in civic participation amongst young people. As some may have uh, alluded to earlier, we had a very low turnout uh, in this most recent local election, uh, and, and, that's not, and that's a common theme, uh, not just here, but across the country. Um, People are just, youth are not uh, participating the way they might have been in uh, 30 or 40 years ago. We've, we've now basically hit the rock bottom on that. Um, I believe that this, having this class at the high school level, coming from the experience of a student here uh, who took all of these courses, uh, is that it would allow, and what I found, um, because I know we do have an AP government, which fosters the same uh, discussion that we may have in this potential class. It, you talk about real issues. You uh, have a sense of understanding about what your role is. Every citizen has a role. Now, I'm someone who is interested, has been interested in getting very involved, something like running for office, but that's, of course, not for everybody. Uh, but everyone has, uh, everyone has a vote in this process. Everyone will probably be serving jury duty. Everyone will come across government in some form or another, or even just paying taxes. So it's important at this level in high school to fully understand that. I did, of course, have this course in eighth grade. And while I understand uh, the importance of it in eighth grade, uh, the impact of having it in high school for everybody would mean that they would, uh, it, it would be the same, same impact that you would have for um, driving classes. You wouldn't teach driving classes uh, in eighth grade, you teach them around, middle, uh, around high school when they um, start, start driving. Um, there's obviously been a lot of discussion uh, as well, and I'd like to touch upon this about um, this impacting people, people's schedules. Uh, I was somebody who was, um, was very much, uh, spoke constantly in favor of allowing people, allowing students to have more choices. Uh, that was obviously a big debate when we changed our school set schedule a few years ago. Um, the, way, the, the way I believe that this would work, looking at the facts and talking to a number of, number of people in this, in this um, high school is that this would not impact um, students uh, in the way that some people might be fearing. Um, this would, it, by simply, you know, taking a look at it and, and moving, moving things around, we can really, without limiting people's choices, uh, truly make this happen at the high school level. Uh, there's not only uh, the ability to, um, to uh, the ability that, to make this happen, but also uh, the arguments, obviously, clearly that have been uh, in favor of it. Um, and, and I'm sure there will be more uh, statistics cited um, throughout the night, uh, just about the low percentage of people that just know basic functions, and, you know, the difference between the executive branch and the legislative branch. Uh, I read a statistic that fewer than half people, half of the people knew who the vice president was a, a, a few years ago. Uh, so, I, you know, and, and there's a litany of different, uh, different articles uh, about this, um, but I only have, of course, uh, th uh, three minutes to talk on this. Well, you probably have a few more seconds. You've oh, all right. Well, <laughs> thank you for telling me that. Well, I want to again uh, thank the school committee uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Great. Thank you. Next up is Diane Davitt. Hey everybody, my name is Diane Davitt and I'm a parent here in town. I have a daughter who graduated a couple of years ago who's a sophomore in college studying nursing and my son is a junior here at East Longmeadow High School. So I have a few questions 
for the school committee. Um, I don't know if now would be the time to answer them, but just to put them out there that this is what I'm wondering about. Mm -hmm. If it is in fact um, voted on, that it does become a requirement. See, I think what I'm hearing tonight is that we already cover civics in eighth grade. 88% um, of the civic standards are covered with US history one and two, and they are required to complete 40 hours of community service. So why would we want to require this course now? And as to what a couple of other students have already mentioned, wouldn't it limit even more of the elective choices that our students have? And I'm also wondering if um, the school committee just voted a few weeks ago to cut back on graduation requirements. And if that's the case, why would we want to make this a requirement at this time? And I'm also wondering about um, if we do require all students to take this course, how much will this cost in terms of books? And do we have enough teachers in the department to teach these courses? So th those are just some of the questions that I have as a parent. Like I said, I'm not sure if this is the right place that you'll be answering them, but those are the things that I'm really concerned about. Well, you want to mention something? Did you want to answer? No, I, I, I think those are all valid questions, and I think what we'd like to do is, is take the questions in. Yep. We have the staff here um, certainly willing to answer a lot of those. Um, in terms of what we did a few weeks ago, we didn't uh, limit or, or lessen the amount of of required courses, we just provided more options, I guess we could say. Um, so I could speak to that as factual. Um, but in terms of um, some of your other questions, I think if we if we kind of get through all the speakers and then we can have some of the staff address some of those things. In terms of options that we might have, um, we've certainly talked about, uh, you know, additional staff that might be required um, if we were to do a standalone course. Um, so there's some some options, but if we could get through the speakers, um, Diane, and then, and then address some of those. Okay, okay. That'd be great. thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. I have a, I think it's Amanda DiNardo. You didn't want to put yourself, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I have a, is it Chris Ruger? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Good evening, uh, my name is Chris Ruger. I am a 23 year teacher here at East Long Meadow High School. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I sit here a little baffled um, listening to how we don't teach civics here at East Long Meadow High School. Um, I'm one of three teachers who teaches five sections of issues, which primarily is based off of three key themes. Civics, then economics, and geography. All three of those themes are embedded within eight different units that we cover. I cover about 80% of the civics standards, 20% of the economics standards. The state of Massachusetts does not mandate students take civics in order to graduate. It is a recommended elective. We cover the elective here. I am also somewhat stunned in the fact that I sit here and I've listened um, through two different uh, department meetings where I was spoken at and not given the opportunity to share the curriculum. Never once has it ever been asked what we teach in issues class. And now I'm here doing this. Um, I want to be very, very cautious that allowing something like this to come in where a citizen is requesting what we teach in schools. Where does this, it's a slippery slope. What does this open up? What's next? Thank you. Thank you. Linda Abel. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for allowing me the chance to speak tonight on something that is very uh, dear to me and to all the people in my department. My name is Linda Abel and I'm the English department chair and a teacher here for uh, 15 years as well as an English teacher in another school system. I wanted to discuss the impact of the mandatory civics class on our curriculum. 
Uh, since the Eastland Meadow Public Schools follows the Mass State frameworks as well as the Common Core State standards, we do teach <coughs> civics in our discipline, even in the English department. There are standards in both of those that relate to civics. I'm going to give you a couple of concrete examples. I and all of the English teachers in the department, so it's not just me, it's all the English teachers, teach uh, in 12th grade, we teach the book Night which focuses on the Holocaust as well as World War II. We talk about the governments and the politics that are involved in that along with citizens' rights and what happens when those rights are taken away. We teach The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which focuses on the um, Vietnam War, and we talk about not only the uh, politics and the government of North and South Vietnam, but we also talk about the politics of the United States, and we talk about citizens and what happens when they have lo they lose their rights, and what happens when they are empowered by their citizenship in order to protest things that they disagree with. We talk about them as students who are 18 years old or going to be 18 years old, and do you vote? Do you practice that? Do you? voice your um, opinions and actively participate. So those things come into the literature because I tell my kids and all of us do in the English department that people write about what they know and what they experience. So you have to know the historical and government aspects in order to understand completely the literature. We also have some electives, and the elective course in which I teach is, and it's just one of the electives, is journalism. And in the journalism class, kids come into class every day, and they have to have a current event that is either concerned with the school, the town, the state, or the, the world at large. Uh, just last week, we had a student talk about how she attended a town meeting and how interesting it was. And the kids were so surprised, what's so interesting about a town meeting? And she told them how she felt she was empowered because she had a voice into what was going on in her own neighborhood. And because of that, the proposal for her neighborhood was not passed. So the other kids started asking questions about that. In journalism, the kids research article topics and they have to interview people. And these people are the people in our communities and our, our towns, our states, that really shape what goes on around them. So they become more aware and they have to interview people. They're not comfortable with that, but those are life skills. And these are things that all have to do with being a good and responsible citizen. In the English department, we've worked along with social studies, and we've had, uh, with the Veterans Education Project, we've had speakers come in who have been veterans of the Vietnam War, and the kids are fascinated by that. We've had people um, previous to this come in who were um, survivors of the Holocaust, although that's a lot harder to get these days because of age. They've come in and talked to our kids about the political aspects, about the rights of citizens and what happens when those things are taken away. So. I guess my, um, my concern is here is that, and I understand Mr. Harrigan's frustration that kids don't know some of the basic thing, things that they should know. As teachers, as parents, as anybody who's worked with kids knows that sometimes you teach them things and they still say they don't understand or they don't know. I've had kids in 11th grade and I've taught them things and then they've come to me in 12th grade and they say, I don't know that, I've never, I don't know anything about that. I go, yes you do because I've taught you. I taught you that in 11th grade. So just because someone doesn't know something or remember something um, doesn't mean that it wasn't exposed to them, taught to them, emphasized to them. Um, sometimes we can jump up and down and say, this is really important and they go, yeah, okay, and they forget. But there are kids who do take an interest in that and we of course try to foster that interest in our kids because they need to know what goes on in the world around them as young adults who eventually will take over the politics of the world. So these things are embedded in our curriculum. The problem with um, having a mandatory civics class is that it will take away a lot from these electives. And we've worked very hard, our guidance department has worked extremely hard trying to get more and more electives for kids because they complain that they have things that they don't have, find interest in. And we've made some great strides with that and we don't want to take a step backwards. So I guess my final question to the group that's here tonight is, does this district really want to um, risk losing all of those possibilities for electives when we already teach the civics that are embedded in our uh, state frameworks and our Common Core State Standards? We do teach um, the civics components, not only in our history and social studies class where you would expect it, but in an interdisciplinary way from the elementary school to the middle school and to the high school in an age appropriate manner. Thank you. Thank you. John Martin. You're up. Okay, so you'll just hold off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next one is Mr. Kiernan. Is he coming?
Good evening. Mr. Smith, members of the East Long Meadow School Committee, administrators, students, teachers, and friends, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is J.P. Kiernan, and this is my 16th year of teaching here at ELHS and my 24th year of teaching in public schools. I serve as the Fine Arts Department Head for grades 6 through 12, and I teach band, orchestra, jazz, AP music theory, music technology, and drum lab. I am here tonight to express my concerns over the issue of adding a civics course as a graduation requirement for students here at ELHS. <clears throat> my concern is not with the subject of civics. I fully support the idea that we should teach our students to become informed citizens, to understand how our government works, and to be active participants in our democracy. At a recent meeting of our department heads, I was proud to learn that our current graduation requirements in social studies U.S. History 1 and 2 in particular cover these important civics issues extensively. For as long as I have been at ELHS, scheduling has been a challenge. Students struggle to get the courses they want while at the same time meet our extensive graduation requirements. It has been routine throughout the years for our performing ensembles to lose many students due to schedule conflicts. We have the best kids. I say it all the time because it's true. And our kids deserve the best. The best experience they can get while they're here at ELHS. Adding an additional required course would seriously limit student course selections and force many students out of our performing groups and fine arts courses. Adding such a requirement when this material is already covered in other required courses would have a disproportionate cost and minimal return for our students. Thank you. Um, Mr. Marhefka, would you like to come up and speak? Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you for uh, letting me speak tonight. Uh, my name is Robert Marhefko. I'm one of the two assistant principals here at the high school. Um, my uh, perspective on this is more of a, a time allotted perspective within, the, within a given school day. Just for some context, um, where some of my concerns lie with um, this proposal or, or, or the proposal of any uh, additional requirement comes down to the fact that uh, we did just review um, we did review our, our time allotted through a recent uh, schedule revision. And, and with that, we really had to look at um, the fact that we have 336 uh, available instructional minutes each day. And one of the things that our staff and, and all our focus groups and committees really had to look at is um, how much time do we actually need uh, within a given uh, class to teach it and learn it effectively each day. Um, so with that, if we're, my concern with adding additional requirements of, of any sort, or I really think that would uh, need to compel us to re-examine uh, re how, uh, how we're dividing up those 336 minutes uh, so we don't get to this tipping point of exposure versus mastery uh, within any of the contents. Because if, you know, in, a, in order to avoid some of the concerns that other, pe uh, other staff or other people brought up, um, to, to add in, you know, a new requirement while keeping everything we, we have, we, we, we would have to really look at, you know, either shortening classes or, or adding more skip days in between classes. There'd be a lot of things that would have to be done, and then we'd really be looking at um, how do we, if, you know, is that model effective for, for teaching and learning any of our subjects? So any, any kind of addition without some kind of retraction will create that issue. Um, within every department, every kid's schedule, and anything needs to be uh, considered moving forward. Thank you. Next, I have Heather Barakovich. Did I get that right? Okay. Nobody does. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. 
it's Burakevich, but that's okay because the whole world gets it wrong. So it's my husband's fault, I suppose. <laughs> um, I'm really fortunate to be able to sit here with everyone tonight, and um, it's a great opportunity to hear both sides of this argument. I'm a new teacher to the district. After 10 years of teaching, this is my 11th year at East Longmeadow High School. Um, and in the past, I've taught you know, what most of us have. So psychology, sociology, US 1, US 2, world history, AP world history, economics, um, the wide bracket that normally we as social studies teachers have when you teach different classes. So that said, I just wanted to mention a couple quick things tonight. <coughs> um, the first being that as a new person here to this school, I just cannot express enough what an incredible student body we have and how incredibly involved they are with what happens here at the high school. Um, I could never have imagined what people said about the high school being true, which is that the students really do have a place that's a community where they feel safe, they feel valued, they feel like they can input their ideas, they feel like those ideas will be heard. Um, another thing that I think is fabulous is just the level, the amounts of courses they can choose from. So elective-wise, forensic science, um, culinary, um, lab, uh, drum, drum circle, or drum lab, pardon me, um, these are things that just aren't offered at most high schools around the country, and I think that East Long Meadow has something that should be um, guarded in this way because the kids really do love to be here for those reasons. They get to choose what makes them them, and they will, they'll be the first ones to tell you how much they look forward to going to those, those different classes that they have an opportunity to take. Um, that said, I worry about the idea of another elective for, or another required course for that reason. And also, I'm a little biased because I've taught world history for nine of these years that I've taught. And my growing concern more and more is that we as Americans don't understand our role and how it plays in the international sphere. Um, we are unfortunately unaware of um, what the realities are with, with how we affect the other, other countries and how they affect us. So um, in that regard, I would be, I'd be really afraid to see world history be taken off the table um, as something that students don't ever get to experience, whether it's in middle school or high school, and then go into the world not having ever been exposed to different religions or different types of governments or um, areas where there are shifting economies um, and, and really not know who they are, right, or who they are in the world. So I would just, um, I would be afraid that um, when adding a fourth, um, a fourth required course that is really a culmination of different uh, standards that I myself have to teach here in contemporary events that the student council um, practices when they meet biweekly, I would be concerned that that particular subject would be taken off the table too. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Peter Van Buren, thank you. Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Van Buren. Uh, I'm a teacher at ELHS in the science department. I'm also a town resident, and I have a son who is a sophomore at, e at ELHS. Um, I am very concerned that the addition of a civics requirement as a separate course will lead to many more students not being able to take the courses that they need to prepare themselves for college, particularly in the areas of math and science. Um, in the past 10 years that I've taught at ELHS, I've really pushed STEM education, as you know, with my robotics program, uh, also in the classroom with physics, trying to grow my physics program, uh, and in our new tech applications course, uh, where we're instituting a makerspace kind of concept as an elective. Uh, I'm very proud um, and excited about the fact that we're now teaching both AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2 this year. Um, and I want to see more students take not only AP Physics, but I want to see more students take all levels of physics. Um, if we add another mandated class, it's going to guarantee that many of these students will not be able to fit physics in their schedule, as well as other higher level STEM classes. Um, it, it might even mean that we may have to cancel some of these classes, um, particularly at the AP level, because perhaps we may not have enough students to run those classes. Um, I'm also here as a parent. Um, I want my son to have the opportunity to take the classes that he needs to be competitive and prepared for college. Uh, I can tell you that it's a challenge for these students to fit everything they want and that colleges are looking for into their schedule. 
Um, he's a sophomore, and he is already extremely stressed about high school. Um, you know, he's had a dream for the last three or four years to be a biomedical engineer, and if we add another class to his schedule, I'm concerned he won't be able to take the courses that he wants to get into the schools that he's looking at. Um, so as a parent and an educator, I'd like to ask the school committee that we not overload these kids any more than they already are. It's the last thing that they need. Thank you very much. Steve Ross. Good evening. I'd like to thank the school administration and school committee for giving me this opportunity to speak to you tonight. I come to you as a 48-year resident of the town of East Saw Meadow and a former school administrator in the state of Connecticut for, the, for 25 years. I was the chief scheduler for the high school for 20 years. And it is true when you add something that something has to come out unless you restructure your scheduling program, your courses. It would appear to me that you have a, almost an inordinate amount of AP courses, whereas you should be moving towards fundamental courses for all children. Civics slash American government is a fundamental course. It should not be an elect, it's an elective here or under I guess contemporary issues. What I've heard is that other departments tap into a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I think what you need is to have a defined course. In Connecticut, we've had a civics requirement as a graduation requirement for the past 20, 25 years. It has been no problem getting the psych courses in, getting the AP courses in. It's, it is a matter of scheduling and time during the day, and I appreciate your issues. We have found that as a direct result of having civics in our curriculum, youngsters get involved in voter registration. A higher percentage of them vote. A higher percentage even participate in Project Close-Up, which is, if I don't even know if you have that program here anymore, but youngsters go to Washington, D.C., and they learn how government operates. And my own daughter did that. It was fantastic. In addition, up until a year or two ago, we, we didn't have Model Congress here. Those are all outgrowths of a civics slash government course. So. In light of today's political climate, and it doesn't seem to be changing uh, for the positive, that's a, a comment, I would like to have the opportunity to have my, my children and even my grandson who attends school here now have the opportunity to take a physics course and see how they can work within the system because they will be taught the system and work within the system to have changes made benefit for them as citizens of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Henry. Hi, I'm Pat Henry, 54 Ridge Road in town, and I'm one of your four voter registrars in East Long Meadow. I'd like to speak in support of adding more physics, more civics, more physics and more civics to the uh, high school curriculum. <clears throat> Not long ago, the minority leader of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, declared, quote, there are three branches of government, House, Senate, and presidency, and they've got to work together, unquote. Many, if not most Americans, uneducated in civics, let, let alone American civics, would probably agree with what he said, but he's wrong in every respect. First off, as the school committee undoubtedly knows, the three branches of the Congress, presidency, and the courts. As we all know, under the Constitution, Congress is supposed to make the laws, the presidency is supposed to implement them, and the courts can settle disagreements about the law. And second, they're not supposed to work together. 
They're supposed to work independently in their own specified duties, maintaining limited government by a separation of powers. If Senator Schumer doesn't understand this, we have a civics problem. I don't think it's fair to say that this course or that course or another course would be lost. That doesn't show a lot of confidence in your school committee or your, or your particularly your school system. If it's important, the school system will make it work. I have more confidence in them than some of the other speakers do. Uh, speaker after speaker spoke about electives. Electives are great. We all like to take basket weaving or something that we want to take. But I agree with the previous speaker that basics are really, really more important. Uh, there are other, ignorance of civics breeds other problems too, beginning with the fact that over 50% of Americans feel no civic obligations to their country or their society. And I know because one of them is my son-in-law. <laughs> Happy to enjoy whatever benefits come from Washington. They don't vote, they don't read the newspaper, they don't care, and they pay taxes only under threat. They can't even identify their own senators in Congress. Civics courses, and the older the better, remind people that just as they have obligations to family, to God, and their neighbors, they have duties to the society to help maintain our government and the protections and services it provides. I support the petitioner's drive to teach U.S. civics to all high school seniors. If they're getting enough civics, as many of the previous speakers, particularly teachers, have said, that's, that's wonderful. I just wonder if they're understanding that they're getting that if it's not put in a core subject. And I support the petitioner's drive to teach because it's better to prepare them to understand their awesome responsibility when I, as your voter registrar, sign them up. Thanks. Thank We're nearing the end of this, but I have, is it Dan Wen? Did I get your last name right? Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Nguyen, and I am a sophomore at East Long Meadow High School. When it comes to social studies, I took world history last year. I am taking US history one now, and I am going to take AP US history next semester. I am a dedicated student who tries to maximize his schedule as much as possible. When it comes to civics, I can speak for many students. My say in this is that I believe that civics should not be a requirement. Despite civics being an important subject and that everyone should understand them before taking our first steps into the adult world, we shouldn't be required to take it. It shouldn't be an obligated class. Instead, it should serve as an optional class for those who want to be educated further about modern civics. Additionally, government is already introduced in U.S. History 1 and 2, which are already requirements for graduation. Making this class a requirement confines students to it and prevents them from taking other social studies courses, such as psychology, African American studies, and contemporary issues. These courses allow us to have a broader perspective of the modern world that we should all be aware of. It is quite unfair that these courses prevent students from taking the classes that are just as important as modern American civics. And when it comes to scheduling, it is quite difficult to fit in other social studies electives with a packed schedule, including cer certain graduation requirements now. For example, in order to take AP US history, I had to self-study algebra two. And if I wanted to take other social studies electives, then I would have no space in order to do that. However, I think that the idea of incorporating a standard or honor civics course is good for those who want to study ahead, but not at an AP level, like AP US government. Personally, I aspire a career in the medical field, and I want to pursue pre-med and biology in college. In order to do this, I should be taking certain AP science and math classes as preparation. However, if civics were to be inputted into the graduation requirements, then this restricts me from taking advantage of the courses offered here that help me pursue my dreams. This applies to every student in the school who would like to achieve their own careers other than civic. 
the Declaration of Independent States that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are unalienable rights that all citizens possess. If so, the student body of ELHS should be able to pursue their own happiness by being free to take the classes that help them build the career they desire for their own future. We can make the decision of what we want for ourselves, and I hope you can understand this in the eyes um, of a high school student. Thank you for your time. That was the last on my sign-up sheet. If there was anyone here that would like to come up but didn't have a chance to, um, you can just start lining up. But again, we'll still be limiting to three minutes. Uh, Mark McGrinney, I'm a lifelong resident and product of the East Middle School System. I have a different perspective on this whole take. Um, in my family, I learned very young, two things to always ignore was religion and politics. I had a Rush Limbaugh loving father, and I had a far left aunt. At every Thanksgiving, we'd have fights over politics. And that's what, how I was introduced to it. Um, we blame kids for having a 7% voting in town. What are the adults? 15% in East Long Meadow? Um, my brother-in-law, he won't even watch the news, refuses because all the media focuses on is polarizing figures and the fringe perspectives on everything. And we try to, and we blame kids for being apathetic. I'm apathetic and I'm a very positive person, you know. Um, our country, we address problems repeatedly by throwing more money and more regulations and more requirements at every problem that our world has in this country. Um, in Einstein, my dad always says, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We're very fortunate here to have, you know, Mr. Smith and Ms. Flanagan support the teachers here in shifting the culture to like student-centered learning where we can get kids to work together, have different opinions, learn how to solve problems together. Um, and I think it's time that we stop blaming young people and stop putting more MCAS and more requirements and more mandates on our young people. And we start acting like the adults in the room and maybe the news, and when we turn the TV on, the perspective will change to people being respectful, and then kids will start wanting to get involved in our country again. Because that's really the root of the problem. And we don't address the root causes of problems. We throw money and regulations at problems. That's just my perspective. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Keefe and I'm a former 2012 graduate of East Salmetto High School. Currently in my second year of graduate school at Springfield College for school counseling, I feel very strongly about this topic. As a future counselor, I believe it's extremely important to give students choices to explore other potential areas such as the various electives we offer here at ELHS. Adding this to the list of requir requirements would create weeks and weeks work worth of work for our counselors, which would take away from interaction time with their students. I had a wonderful experience here and this is where I realized I would like to be a school counselor because I had options and flexibility within my schedule to participate in things that interested me in the field. If I was forced to take civics and not my choice of psychology in my fourth year of social studies, I wouldn't have been able to expose myself to the subject that is the foundation of my current career path. While knowledge of the government and knowing your role as a citizen is extremely important, you can't force students to care or even listen if you were to make this a requirement. Seeing how civics is already a requirement in the eighth grade cu curriculum, it would not make sense to make it a graduation requir requirement for every high school student. This could mean that some students would have to take it again their freshman year and it would just be repetitive and a waste of time. I feel strongly in student choice and believe that we should not make this a requirement. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Mayu, and I'm a senior in East Longmeadow High School. So through my high school career, I've had three different schedules. I've had the requirements changed on me, I think two to three times in the sciences, at physical education, and now the electives, which is being reduced. 
Adding this new elective or new requirement for students would bring up the lack of continuity and scheduling conflicts and schedule choices for students because college too you have a free schedule and you're you have a choice to choose the classes you want and so that allows students to really focus on what they want to learn and to find what they want to learn in college has to be based on classes they take in high school and offering that optional elective in 12th grade after having all those other years of history courses and science courses that are mandated allows them to focus on what they want to do in their life and really makes them passionate towards one object or idea. Another point to bring up is um, if this is such a big concern for high school students, why weren't we made aware of this? The only reason I knew this public forum was happening tonight is because my mom's on school committee. If this involves the school, then there needs to be more emails sent out to the students in order for them to know about these public forums and to get them involved with the civics in this town. So really, civics shouldn't be mandated if it's incorporated by the teachers, if there is more, an, more of an effort for students to come to the public forums like tonight, because I can see many of my fellow students here. And it's shown that if they're made aware of it, they will come and they will support because there are students passionate about the government. And you can see that because it's not a band-aided requirement and their passion for it hasn't been killed by the school system. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Noah Secondo, and I'm a senior here at ELHS. So just to give you an idea of what I've been doing over the past four years, uh, my civics engagement has kind of run the gamut. I've done APUSH, I've done AP US government, I run the Poli Sci Club, I've interned, I've campaigned, I've been involved in student government. Um, I mean, let's just say the Library of Congress is bookmarked in my web browser. Um, <laughs> Now, I agree that civics is an extremely important subject for high schoolers to discuss and learn about, but I also agree with um, Principal Allen's point that the middle school level is really a valuable time to learn about these topics that are so fundamental to our society today. And it's very valuable for high schoolers to have the opportunity to take more electives in the arts, or physics for example, um, to better reflect their interests down the line, or simply to give them the ability to explore different courses that may uh, become their future careers. So uh, some people have questioned whether we're meeting the civics requirements uh, right now, but for the most part we are. I mean, we have an eighth grade civics course, we have US History 1, we have US History 2, we have AP US Government, we have um, AP US History, and there are tons of electives, and uh, as Ms. Abel uh, talked about, they're integrated into all the courses that we have here at the high school. So I would just like to offer a possible compromise. So much of the civics uh, requirements, as I just stated, are covered in the U.S. history curriculum. So to fill in the blanks, we could utilize our brand new Spartan block that we have this year. Uh, so one week, for example, we could provide juniors and seniors the opportunity, uh, the opportunity to register or to pre-register to vote. Um, obviously, that wouldn't be a requirement, but just as a suggestion and kind of teach them about the process. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your time. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, Seth Bracci, current senior at East Meadow High School. Uh, similar to my friend Noah, I have spent a lot of my time at East Meadow High School sort of shaping my schedule to reflect my interest in social studies, history, and things of that nature. And therefore, I can respect the ideas of both sides of the argument, whereas, you know, some people are able to take a definite stand. I think I sort of fall in the middle, whereas I, I attribute a, a ton of value to the the importance of civics in today's society. Obviously, you can see it in the numbers with the voting percentages for young people in Niso Meadow. Honestly, it's sad that so many people don't take advantage of the ability that's offered to them once they're eligible to vote. And therefore, I think there's a lot of 
apathy that exists among young people for voting issues and political issues that arise from elected officials voicing their opinion on the national stage, people get upset and oftentimes the people who get the most, <coughs> the most upset are the people who either didn't vote or never used their opinion in a structured way. So therefore I see the value in having a civics course and obviously that exists in the eighth grade level. Personally, as an eighth grader, I don't think that like I said, I'm a senior now. Four years ago as an eighth grader, I don't think that I really received the necessary time or attention to really get those civics points across. And like Principal Allen was saying, new teachers have been hired. And the old teacher that I had, Mr. Sherpa, I love him to death, but I just don't think that the civics point got driven home as well as it should have. Eighth grade, vulnerable time in your life. You know, a lot of things are changing, a lot of things are going on, and therefore, it's a good time to learn things. And I think that civics being one of those fundamental things, like everyone is, keeps saying, fundamental thing, it's such a great time for you to get that fundamental thing because you are starting to understand the world around you. You're starting to look beyond what your typical boundaries are within your mind. And I think that eighth grade is a good place for it because as you enter high school, as you enter that sort of time period where you inch closer to being able to vote, you sort of start to develop your own political opinion and your own sense of civic duty, and I think eighth grade is an excellent time for that. As, as uh, arguing for the idea that an extra requirement would be too much of a hassle, I think that personally as someone who's pursued social studies so heavily in high school, taking AP US history, AP US government, uh, taking African American studies as an elective this year as a senior. I've now taken five courses in the social studies with a requirement of three, so I've really tried to take this into something that I appreciate and like. So having that one extra requirement wouldn't necessarily be a hassle to myself, but I can see the passion in a lot of my fellow students that this would be something that would hinder their ability to pursue other things. And those people who do not necessarily have that passion like myself and Noah have for social studies, it may seem almost unfair to them that they're not able to, you know, go to those fine arts electives or go to any of these electives that really show and represent something that they're passionate about and want to pursue later in their life. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, hi, everybody. I would like to thank you all for allowing me to have this platform to speak my mind. Um, my name is Lyric Dixon, and I'm currently a junior here at e ELHS. And this was brought to my attention a few days ago. And since then, I have taken the time to reflect on what this would mean personally for me. My freshman year, I was actually supposed to take band and schedule conflict or whatever, and I ended up in chorus. And to my surprise, I actually really liked it, and it has inspired me to pursue a career in music therapy. And one thing that I am thankful for here is having the option to take these electives and as I've sat here and I've heard multiple people speak and I do believe that some of the points that were taught to me in eighth grade during civics are still um, relevant to me now. I am the president of the GSA which stands for the Gender and Sexuality Alliance here at East Long Middle High School and part of what we do is activism and that includes civics in action, like me speaking here right now is civics in action. And one of the things that we do, even as an extracurricular activity outside of school after the bell rings, is that we inform people of how to make changes locally and how that can influence changes around the world. And I 
sitting here speaking to you all, I can say that I am lucky to have such a supportive school, such a supportive group of teachers, and such a, a supportive guidance counselor who has really encouraged me to do these things. And it has opened up my perspective. And from transferring here as a little sixth grader to here I am now as a junior, if it wasn't for this layout and these courses, I think I would probably have a lot of different thoughts and experiences and beliefs. And I just want to say that that I don't think that it should be a um, required thing. Sorry. I didn't hear that well. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have like a prepared speech, so I may not be as eloquent as everyone else here, but I hope you'll allow me to speak anyway. Um, my name is Rachel Wood. I'm a senior here at East Longmeadow High School. And basically, I'm just worried about um, how adding another requirement is going to impact everyone because uh, with my experience with the with the scheduling system here, it's just very difficult to get in the courses that you want. And I understand there's certain things that we need to be taught. But um, I think there needs to be an opportunity for kids to develop their own specific interests. And that's really crucial at like the upper grade levels. Um, so adding another requirement, especially senior year, it's going to make it even more difficult to get in the classes that people may want to pursue in college. And so if they don't have that opportunity to like, you know, explore those interests, it's going to make it even more difficult. However, I do understand um, the concern that young people aren't as involved in the community and in civics. And I think it is an important issue. And so maybe it should be definitely involved in our schedule. And I know it is um, distributed throughout other courses. Um, and it's taught in eighth grade. But I think it may definitely be um, more helpful to have it at the um, higher level grades when people are closer to being able to vote. Um, I don't know about it as a required course in 12th grade, but one possible idea as a compromise might be like maybe condensing U.S. history into one course in 10th grade and then having civics as a required course in 11th grade. That way the option is still left open in 12th grade for the electives. Or if there's maybe a more, um, a more structured like, um, a more structured, uh, what's the word, just like a unit in um, US history one or two that covers it, even though it does, I know already cover a lot of it, but maybe just have like a good chunk of it that includes that. So that way we get that involved as well without having to add another required course. So um, yeah, I just want to make sure that my fellow students aren't like burdened with uh, another required class that's going to make high school even more difficult than it already is. And I hope that we can come to a good compromise. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Matthew Wilson. I'm currently a junior at East Palmetto High School. Now, a lot of people have been talking about their problems with the whole civics being a requirement. I like civics. I'm currently taking AP US government and also at the same time taking business law one. And it covers that partially, not even fully, but I don't think it needs to be required because you think about it, people like last year, I doubled up on math. 
I took Algebra II Honors and Pre-Calc Honors so I could take AP Calculus this year. If we had another history class that's being required, there's no guarantee I would be able to follow my pursuit of ha not happiness, math. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing I want to touch upon is I can't remember a year within the past seven years where there's been stability. From going to Birchland, whole new situation. You got different teachers every single day. Next year, new principal. And then some schedule changing around that. And then moving on to the high school, another schedule change after that, another schedule change after that. I'm tired. <laughs> I have had seven straight years. Change is good. There's no doubt about that, but there's a limit to how much change should be done. I mean, I'm 16 years old, but I feel like I'm 80. <laughs> and it's just the mental stress has been caused upon by each year by year, never knowing, are things going to be the same? How's life going to change? I just don't, I take it day by day and tell myself it's all going to be okay, but I never know what's going to happen the next day because there is, has not been a great amount of stability and it's just, if we add in this, it takes away another layer of stability and oh, it's just, I don't know how much more like changes that people like me can take. It's just taxing on my brain, but thanks. <laughs>Hi, my name is Kate Rucci. I'm a, a proud graduate of East Summit High School, 1991, where we did have Model Congress then. Um, also a Springfield College grad, and I'm very, very um, dedicated to community efforts and the uh, good of everybody and making sure that um, there's value to decisions that are made on behalf of an entire town or community. Um, one of the biggest things that I think is the push for the civics requirement, which I love. I think I was happier to turn 18 to vote than I was to turn 21 to drink. I, was I have never been out of a, um, an election, no matter where we've lived. We've lived in seven different places in 21 years, and it's very, very, very important to me. If you're a Facebook friend of mine, you know where I stand. Um, the biggest thing, I think, is that mandating a course in civics will not create new voters change, um, exposure to different ideas, to different um, academic providers, whether it's a different type of educator, or it's a different type of subject, but not mandating a course for students to take that could take up a valuable block of time for their strengths. Um, I can say that pushing a kid who can't or doesn't choose to read to take more English doesn't make them major in English. Taking a good kid like me who couldn't stand math, giving them more math, I had nothing to do in, with math in college, only that I had to do. And it wasn't because I liked it more because I was made to do it, it was because it was part of a um, program that was directed towards my major. So everybody will get a piece of physics with, or civics, which I think is brilliantly important because we all are Americans, we all are required as a um, human and societal effort to be part of this world for each other, but I don't think it should be mandated in order to create um, a, another click at the voting booth um, or another op opinion. I think we all are, um, have those presented to us either on our own, by our families, by the people that surround us, and we are um, able to make those decisions on our own. Thank you, have a good evening. Um, hi, my name is Cassidy O'Connor. I'm a junior here at East Palmetto High School. Um, I have a few issues with this. Um, first of all, I think that civics is already implemented in so many of our classes, but a lot of people have touched on that, so I'll skip over it. Um, I love politics, and I love learning about civics and about how government works, and I'm currently in AP US government, um, and I'm, on the, I'm in the debate club, so I'm very involved in learning about how our country works. But my real issue is with having this as a requirement. Um, 
My grades don't really reflect this, but I'm not a dedicated student at all. I do the bare minimum to get the grade that I need. <laughs> but this year, <laughs> I know, I know. But this year, I got to choose a lot, of, a lot more of my classes than I have in the past. And I really, I wake up and I'm ready to go to school and I'm excited to go to most of my classes. And I feel like I'm doing far more work than I've ever done in my school career because I want to um, for six out of the seven of my classes. Because for one class, I it wasn't a requirement for me to take it to graduate, but to get the other classes that I wanted, um, I had to fill up the space with this class. And I'd say on a good day, I give it 60% effort. I really, I am not excited to go to it. I don't like the class. I don't do enough work for it. Um, so, th so that's my problem with having another requirement is that, yes, you'll accomplish that you're teaching civics, but I don't think anyone will really learn it. I think they'll just get through it so they can graduate and do what they actually want to learn. So thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Cochran, and I am currently a junior here at East Long Meadow High School. Um, this is my third year here, and in these three years, I have had I have like experienced three different schedule changes. Um, these schedule changes alone have um, made me lose the opportunity to take certain electives that would have been beneficial to me in my future, such as Spanish 4 and stuff like that. Um, as far as social studies courses go, um, I've taken U.S. History 1, I took AP U.S. History, and currently I'm taking the electives AP Psychology and African American Studies, and I love both of them. I am excited to learn about them. I apply myself in them which in previous years, when I have had to take courses that were mandatory, I didn't apply myself. Um, I didn't think I was gonna come up here and talk. I didn't have anything prepared until like an hour ago. Um, but it's because I feel very strongly about this issue. Um, in eighth grade, I took my first civics class with the new teacher. It was his first year, and it was my first year ever like learning about the government. Um, it was at this point that I did develop an understanding and an appreciation for our government and how it impacts our lives. And it was in this class that I developed my political opinion, yes, at the age of 14. Uh, <laughs> And I still am still with it. Um, I think that eighth grade is such, and like in eighth grade, you learn a lot about yourself, and you like you develop who you are. And I think that it's a really great age to learn about civics because you're developing as a person, and with that development, you are developing, or like you have the poss like you have the ability to develop your political opinion. Um, Requiring another civics course would limit not only electives, but other classes that would benefit students in our future, in our college admissions, in our future professions. Um, and I'm aware that the intentions of this class is not to take away electives and other classes, but the fact of the matter is that it will take away these classes. Um, all this being said, I do think that civics is an important topic to learn about, but I also know that we um, we do experience civics in other classes, like U.S. history and um, some of the other social studies electives. Um, I think that requiring another civics class for us to take would um, limit and, if not, take away our choices as students to choose our path for the future. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Hello, um, my name is Philip Dumitroglu, and I am a junior at East Longmeadow High School. Um, I'm also very interested in politics and government and debate. I, am, I took AP U.S. History last year. I'm currently involved in AP U.S. Government and Politics on the debate team and in Model Congress. And I would just like to point out that the, the, the fact that the basis of the pro-civics requirement argument is, is that it will enlighten students with the desire to vote. Um, and from my point of view, a vote, a vote is a form of choice, and learning how to make choices is a very important aspect of voting. Now, weighing the trade-off of certain choices is a very important element of this. Um, and I would just like to ask, how can students be expected to make choices in voting when like, we're trying to limit our choices with our classes? Um, exploring different interests is a very important part of high school and something I find to be a very rewarding part of you know, my growing up in independence as a young adult. Um, and I don't think it should be sidelined further by more requirements. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, history electives are very high in number, as you can see up here. And each of these electives covers a part of civics and looks at the role of citizenship through different and, more importantly, worldly le lenses, such as world history. So I just don't think that we should add another requirement for students to, um, to graduate, because that would limit the ability of students to take other history electives. Thank you. I wasn't planning on speaking, but my name's Sharon O'Connor. I have three children in the school system, 11th grade, 9th grade, and 7th grade. Um, I do think civics is important, but I'm against this proposal. Uh, for starters, I don't think the 7% um, turnout rate is completely accurate because students go away to school between 18 and 24, and they stay registered in their hometown. Even though it's still an abysmal rate, it's not accurate. And Touching on what Mr. Macarini said, it starts at home. The adult turnout rate is terrible in this town. I haven't missed a primary ever, and my kids know this. They know I vote. And just like Miss Abel said about how one of her students became empowered when she spoke at a town meeting, that comes from home. And I don't think um, forcing someone to take a civics class would encourage or spark an interest. My student, my, not my students, my children have taken um, every required course plus AP government, AP psychology, business law. They've been in the debate club, even though sometimes they only put 60% effort into their <laughs> <laughs> work. <laughs> this is the first year a real interest has been sparked. And part of the purpose of education is to spark an interest and lay the foundation at the right time. And I do think that civics in the eighth grade is the right time to lay the foundation because that's when they're becoming more aware of the world around them. And it just continues on like that. And now interests are sparked to take it further. Where do they want to go? And they wouldn't have the opportunity for some of these science classes and psychology classes if they were forced to take another elective. And I know you're going to talk about finances, but I just have to say, one of my um, children, they don't have desks in one of their classrooms, and some of them don't have enough textbooks to take home with them. So it, it's also a financial issue. I mean, it's, it's the value of education, but it's also finances. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, I don't see anyone else lining up to speak, so at this point, I'd like to ask the administration team and the department head to come up, or I don't know who's coming up. Is it Dr. Flanagan, John Martin? Okay, and guidance, sorry. So I'm just, if you have something you'd like to say, by all means, if not, I would open it up for discussion on my board to ask any questions. So if you have something you want to say, this would be your opportunity. Well, first of all, I think... My, par my parents and my teachers and my students said a lot tonight, which I'm really, truly proud 
because as someone said earlier, it's civics in action. So you can see that we do have students who care about their civic involvement. Um, one of the things um, I should probably introduce myself first and foremost. Um, I'm Dr. Dina Flanagan and I'm the principal of the high school. I am a former teacher of United States AP history. I taught modern world history. I also taught law. I was a political science major in my home state of Florida. I worked on many uh, Senate campaigns. I was also very active in politics. I was a, a volunteer for the United States Forest Service. Uh, civics responsibility has been long embedded in my personal life as well. So it's a topic that I'm, pa I'm passionate about individually. Um, one of the ELHS learning standards, and we were very conscientious about doing this when we started to developing the learning uh, expectations years ago, was that we want our students to demonstrate social and civic responsibilities. We actually have a rubric that our, we ask our teachers to assess our students on this from time to time. Um, one thing we are all in agreement, I think, in this room tonight is that we do want to see our students develop a social and civic responsibility. That is why four years ago, through our senior project, we worked very hard to develop more opportunities for our students to get involved in pursuing their passion and working with members of our community. If you know anything about the senior project, it is one in which students um, select a topic of their choice. We ask them to outreach to the community, find a mentor, and develop their passion and interests. Our, our judging for that, for the senior project, we invite members of the community from politics to town offices to local TV stations from colleges and universities so that our students get that exposure to being part of the bigger community. Another big addition that we did at the high school in the last two years um, was to develop the Community Action Learning Course. And for those of you who are not familiar with that course, that course is Civics in Action. The whole premise besides Community Action Learning is we want our students to work collaboratively with one another to identify an issue in their community that they want to be active in problem solving. And so with that course, we ask our students to get out into the community, talk to town officials, talk to leaders in the community that are experts in the area that you're passion, and work collaboratively to solve that problem. So that's a course that we're very, very excited about. And I don't want to be redundant because I know we've been here a long time. Um, there's, not, there's a lot of stuff that I was going to say, but I think I'm going to kind of tailor it. But I do want to stress that it, at East Lamont High School, we do not believe that social civics education is just the responsibility of the social studies department. And you see that embedded in so many different areas. Um, just last week, I was in an English course, and they were studying um, the, the musings of Plato and how that has led to enlightenment and led to um, advocacy. So that is embedded in a lot of the courses. Again, I don't want to get too, in, in, too much redundant. Um, the one thing I want to point out as a district, in East Lamont Meadow Public Schools, our teachers, our administrators, our central office staff put a lot of thought into the appropriate sequence for social studies education. American government civic and civic standards are taught at all levels, not just at the high school, not just at the middle school. They are embedded into our curriculum from kindergarten on. Every year, there is social studies education that is developed for our students. And we do that in a very collaborative process. And we follow, we follow three tenets when we're looking at our social study curriculum. One, we look at the requirements and recommendations from the state of Massachusetts, the, also known as DESE. We also look at the student's readiness level at each level to interact with the ideologies and complex uh, concepts that are involved in civic education. And three, we are always focused on trying to, create the, trying to create a model that helps our students become socially informed, responsible citizens. At the high school level, as, as many of you have referenced tonight, it is a very complex schedule. Our graduation requirements are driven by the state re required courses and courses that are most uh, mentioned by our colleges and university by our students to gain acceptance. These requirements, although very necessary, oftentimes reduce the opportunity for our students to pursue courses that appeal to their personal interests and college and career goals. I think that we could all agree that that's one of the biggest components of high school is to get them ready for the real world, help them identify what those passions are. That is why at the high school we have taken a very thoughtful approach in which courses we require of our students. Just a couple of weeks ago, based on the feedback from surveys that we did with our students and with our parents who overwhelmingly asked us to reduce graduation requirements, we came before a school committee and sought and granted approval to modify our graduation requirements to allow our students more options. The challenge we have in front of us today is whether we add yet another required course in the form of civics. 
What is important to note that the majority of our students do indeed take four years of social studies. And I want to say very clearly, Esau Meadow High School offers civics education. It is done explicitly during the AP government course, but it, as you've heard from many of our teachers here tonight, it is embedded in almost everything that we do. When our students reach their senior year, we have worked to create a variety of electives that may be of, of interest to our students based on the knowledge that they have built from three years of participating in modern world history, U.S. History 1 and 2. These electives provide a much more concentrated and deeper examination of specialized topics such as government, current events, psychology, and African American studies. What we lack in our elective offering is not a government course because we have that already. I would argue that we would need an economics course because that is not a course that we have a lot of exposure to in our curriculum. If we add a civics requirement, it would either reduce or eliminate social studies electives or section offerings that include AP courses. It also would have a ripple effect in many of the electives offered in other departments. As we know, particip participation in AP courses is highly desired by most colleges and keep our students competitive in the college application process. And please keep in mind that in addition to civics, there are many other topics that people in the community have voiced that we should require of our students. I've had people come up to me and say, you should mandate personal finance. I think a lot of us agree that makes sense. We also have other who have been campaigning that we make uh, economics another requirement. We must be very thoughtful in mandating requirements. Each time we require students to take a course, it forces us to limit their choices to produce, pursue a course that is special interest to them. There's only so many slots in a student's schedule for courses. There are only so many courses that they can take. Lastly, I feel very compelled to highlight all the wonderful things our students and our teachers are doing outside the classroom in regards to political, social, and community service. I am incredibly proud of the teachers, and many of them are here today, supporting our students, who inspire our students to think critically of the world around them and work with them on so many worthwhile projects in our community. For example, I want to tell you how um, a lot of these clubs that are developed these in high school are not generated by teachers or myself, administration. We have kids come to us every year saying, I want to do this. And that, what that translates to, for example, we just had this year a group of students came to the administration saying, we want to start a UNICEF club. And with no prompting from any of us, they are uh, creating a campaign where they are collecting money for the victims of the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Again, that was, that was them coming to the table. So when I hear that our students are apathetic, I can give you countless uh, examples of where they've made a difference in our local community. And I won't name all the clubs, but just to give you a clue, the Key Club does so much for our community, uh, the Environmental Club, the GSA, Multicultural Club, uh, COPE. There are so many um, options for our students to get involved socially and politically at East Summit High School. So the only thing I will say is whatever we decide on this issue, I hope it will allow students to continue to follow their passions and be exposed to a wide variety of intellectual topics that have meaning to them. And one thing I'd like to suggest, and we've talked about this um, extensively, Let's have our students and our parents have a say in this process. Maybe that we can do a survey of some sort um, to get even further you know, involvement in this discussion. But I just want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate all positions on the subjects. I know that every one of us here wants what's best for our students. We might just have a different way of getting there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is John Martin. I'm a school counselor here. This is uh, my 19th year at, at the high school on staff. I'm beyond proud to say that I was born and raised in East Longmeadow, graduate of East Longmeadow High School, and have had just the most amazing uh, career because of our students and staff over the last 19 years. I want to thank Mr. Harrigan for uh, bringing this issue to the forefront so we could have this kind of dialogue. I just want to speak for a few minutes from a guidance perspective and dispel uh, some of the uh, sort of discussion that's gone on um, relative to, to scheduling because I, I've heard a lot tonight and unfortunately I work with individual students every year who are um, confined uh, by our schedule and for me as a school counselor we try very hard to take both a developmental approach and an individual approach with our students and that is we work with our students often in small groups to talk to them about uh, their long-term plan 
but a, a rich, rich part of our work are these individual conversations that we have with kids around how we can match passion with purpose. How we can take what these kids love and find a way to get them exposed to it as much as we can. I don't think there's any argument from anybody in this room that civics is critically important. And I want to dispel the notion that if we were told by our administrative leadership, uh, we had a former principal speak before who mentioned that if you add a new course, well, obviously something has to go, but there's always a way to do it. And he's exactly right. Uh, and we, we pride ourselves in our guidance staff about working as hard as we can to put together the best schedules we can for our kids, but they haven't had any stability with their schedule. And if we were told uh, by our administrative leadership, starting with the superintendent's office and the school committee and our high school administration, that we had to add another course, then we would. And we wouldn't care if it took two weeks, as somebody mentioned, or three weeks. Uh, we had a young man mention that it's not as difficult as people want us to believe. Well, it is as difficult uh, as we would want you to believe, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do it. We want to do what's best for our students in every decision that we make. I might be missing something, and, and maybe somebody can help me with this from our elected body or our superintendent. We keep talking about making civics a requirement. Mr. Smith talked to us about our high school pathway and that we embed our eighth grade studies into our high school pathway. And unless I'm missing something that I think is critically important, we do require civics. It is required in eighth grade. Now that may not sit well with everybody in this room, but I'm a huge believer in our school system. I'm a huge believer in our kids. I want to believe in the decisions that our elected body, our superintendent, our curriculum committees, not just as an educator, as a graduate, as a parent of two kids in this district, I want to believe that you believe that we're guiding our kids down the right path. I come to work every day fired up with that belief that I'm being guided by people who love our kids, who believe in the path that they have established for our kids. So, unless I'm missing something, and I'm not politically savvy at all, I'm far more patriotic than I am political, and I think that's what we're missing in this country. I think uh, so much of what these kids are inundated with from the media, from other out outlets, I think we are stripping these kids of their sense of patriotism, not politics. And I think there's a huge difference between the two. Because the average age of the fighting man and woman in this country is 19 years old. And if you ask them who their state senator was, they might not know. But if you ask them why they were fighting, they'd be able to tell you every second of every day. And I don't think you need a civics course in high school to know that. So I believe in what we're doing now because I'm not an expert in this field. But I believe in my social studies teachers. And I don't believe it's an accident that more of our kids take social studies electives by choice than any other electives that we offer in this high school. I don't believe that's an accident. I believe that speaks to who they are as teachers. I believe that speaks to how they inspire our kids to want to go beyond their requisite graduation requirements. So in terms of would we change a schedule, it's what we do as school counselors. But more importantly, we have conversations with students about how we can match passion with purpose and how we can get these kids exposed to things that they want to get up and get excited about. Like I get excited about coming to work every day. There was a comment that was mentioned earlier about electives. And those electives were equated to basket weaving. Because I love my kids so much and I care about this job so much, I took umbrage to that comment. And the reason I did is I worked with a girl several years ago, and she loved to sew, and she loved to weave. And then that passion for sewing and weaving, well, she started designing clothes. And she took our history graduation requirements. She was an active voter. And she lives in New York City now, and she designs for Nordstrom. And I talk to her all the time, and she says, if I wasn't exposed in school 
to the chances and the opportunities that I had in school, well, I don't know that I'd be working for Nordstrom today. And that basket weaver became a clothing designer for Nordstrom. So I don't ever want to take opportunities away from students that ignite a fire in them that unless you do the job that we do every day, you get a chance to see, and I get to see it every single day. I believe in civics. I believe in it strongly, but I believe it's offered right now. And I believe it's offered in eighth grade. And so I'm going to rest in the professional expertise of my colleagues, my educational leadership, my administrative leadership, to believe that what we're doing for these kids is working for these kids. And that maybe Mr. Harrigan's input can allow us to have even more fruitful discussions about how we can embed this even further into our kids' lives, not just in the high school, but across the curriculum. And that would be my hope. Thank you. Well, my name is Eddie Polk, and I don't know how I'm going to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> or all of this, um, to be honest with you, because I didn't know quite what to expect I am the chair of the social studies department, and I've been in that position for about seven weeks. So I am having the heck of a, a training ground um, in, this, in this process. But uh, I'm so proud when our students come up here, regardless of which side of the issue they were on, it's just wonderful to see such passion um, in our students to pursue things that, that really interest them. And it's really a preparation for their post-graduation goals, and I don't care what it is you're interested in as long as it's productive. One of the things that's been talked about here is just using the word civics, civics, civics. And I'm so afraid I'm going to say physics. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying civics uh, to enunciate. Now, civic education is certainly important, but I try to impart upon our students, and I know that our staff does well as well, civic virtue. How do you go about doing your responsibilities and providing your service to your community? Are you going to be selfless or are you going to be selfish? Are you going to try to make your, your community greater for all? That's the question. When we are talking about what's going on in this high school, what I've heard tonight with the structure and the framework of the things that we have, to me it sounds like we're doing the best we can for as many as we can and we're all pitching in to do that. When it comes to who's the advisor of a particular club, to me, that doesn't much matter. Even though this particular advisor does have a social studies license, he was interested in that. And I do thank Mr. Harrigan for reviving that club. Model Congress is important because there's something that's been missing from this discussion, and people have touched on it. It's not a matter of taking another class. When students don't remember or adults don't remember the things they learned, it's because they haven't used it. Application is the key. And another class is not going to guarantee application. And we have a number of clubs where this takes place, and Model Congress is one of those clubs. So much so that I'm collaborating the best I can, working with Mr. Phelan in terms of keeping that going. To, Mr. to Dr. Flanagan's point earlier in regards to student interest, yes, student interest drives those clubs. The example she was using earlier about the UNICEF club, two lovely young ladies um, got involved in this over the summer, and they actually established a national charter for our school. They established that charter, not us. And they came up to me and asked, Mr. Polk, you know, we started this club, and we need an advisor, and we'll do all this work. And I said, sure. Another young uh, individual who came up here to speak tonight had a club that he was running, doing a great job running it last year, and they needed a new advisor. Came up to me. 10 or 11 of them, eager, wide-eyed, ready to take on the world. Mr. Polk, you know, we need an advisor. Do you mind if you advise our new poli sci club? Not a problem. I am not taking any credit because they are doing all the work. But to say that we're not interested in being part of these clubs is just disingenuous. And beyond that, at one point two years ago, we've had a couple of social studies teachers retire. At one point, four of the social studies teachers in, the, in our department of seven were advisors to clubs. We're doing as much as we can for as many as we can. I also am very passionate about cultural competency. It's one of the things I really try to focus on 
in our studies. And social studies actually gives us the liberty to do a lot. And multicultural club and African American studies are two of the proudest accomplishments for me as an educator. I'm proud of that. And I'm proud that our students are always reiterating to me how much it's had an impact on their lives and getting information, getting letters from their parents or comments from their parents saying the same thing. We all have passions. As social studies teachers, we are responsible for following the state standards, but also trying to embed things that we think are important in those standards. If you ever look at the state standards, you see that there are strands. There are history strands, there are government strands, um, there are economic strands, and there are geography strands. So we actually have to try to do a lot. And when you see those numbers on the paper that say, you know, government standards are embedded in 88% you know, of the US history curriculum, that is true. And we're responsible for covering all of that, providing instruction in all of that. And it's important because we want well-rounded individuals. To Dr. Flanagan's point earlier, the state suggests two electives and we are already offering one of them. We're not offering the other one. Dr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Harrigan's proposal is an important one because it led to an important dialogue tonight. And I did not expect to hear as many people speak tonight as I did, but I'm glad I did. I've been up since five in the morning. I'm sure some of you maybe even earlier. <laughs> and I don't have a problem sitting here and listening to this because it is an important dialogue you have started. And it's not to say two things happened. Until we really sat down to look at what it is we do, I don't think I fully comprehended how much we actually do. But it's also important to note that there are areas where we could improve instruction and there are reasonable, sensible solutions to do that. A couple of students came up and offered some of those ideas. Noah talked about the advisory. That would be a great idea to be able to do a voter registration opportunity. Now it's against the law for us to force students to register the vote, um, but we certainly encourage, we certainly emphasize the importance and the sacrifices that people made before us to give us these opportunities to do that, but we can't force them. I was speaking with Ms. Ruger earlier this week and she was telling me about an uh, assignment she does in her contemporary issues class, which I'm glad she came up and explained because I don't think everybody really understood what that was. It's basically current event civics. And she was telling me how she pulls up the uh, Secretary Galvin's website, she talks about all the things you can do and how you can register, and she provides opportunities for students to do that. What a great idea for an opportunity to be able to embed that into an advisory block and students who are at that age that are eligible to do that to be able to do that school-wide. We could do school-wide initiatives. We could celebrate Constitution Day. We could celebrate History Day. There are things that we could do if we provided the opportunity to do it within our framework. I mentioned application earlier because application to me is lost in this conversation. While Mr. Harrigan has brought up an important, bite, important point about civics education, I think it's important to remind ourselves the importance of social studies education. And you know, STEM education is so important. Mr. Van Buren, I'm with you. Ms. Abel, ELA, so important. I'm with you. But for a while now, across the nation, not just the East Long Meadow, social studies has kind of been in the shadows. And one of the things that has happened in the last five years is social studies has, and I'm proud of this, has been a part of reinforcing literacy skills in our school to help get our scores back to where they need to be. I have no problem with that. I just want everybody to understand that as social studies teachers, we do that. Social studies, we're teaching kids about their lives and their society, which encompasses everything, everything. So that's a daunting task. And it would be dis disingenuous to blame social studies teachers for someone not remembering the three branches of government or not knowing who their senator is. Yes, that's important. And I cringe. If you're a social studies teacher or even an educator, you cringe at that. That's like raising a child you know you taught manners to, and then you don't hear them say please or thank you. You cringe. But it doesn't mean we, didn't, we don't teach it. I also think it's important to understand that there are so many things that we could make requirements. I'm sure there are a lot of our students that don't know the capital of every country in Europe or in Latin America, but we're not going to start a mandatory geography class. We do the best we can for as many as we can. There are seven teachers in the department, and by far, 
We offer the most electives, it's not even close, for students to take. 233 students take electives in our department. We have one of the most diverse arrays of elective offerings in the school. And as you heard tonight, many students appreciate that. And it's not that we don't appreciate civics, and just to reemphasize the point, it's we are teaching civics. When you look at those numbers, the 88% in US history, the 80% in contemporary issues, the 67% in, in modern world, some students may not even understand, wait, what are you talking about civics in modern world? Well, there are governments around the world, and when you study them, you can't help but draw comparisons to ours. That takes place. Those discussions happen. Well-rounded students. Isn't that what we're here for? When you look at those statistics, they're only comparing the numbers and the government standards to the US standards. It's not telling you the instruction piece. We are exceeding those numbers. And due to this process, I learned a lot more about that. One of the things that we put together as a department, and we want everyone to take one on the way out if they'd like to take one. Just yesterday, we did a Google document and we said, you know what, let's just jot down some of the civic-specific civic things that we cover or that we teach in our classes. And we came up with a list of quite a few dozen. Everything from local Massachusetts, who are your town leaders, all the way up to Constitution, comparing that to the Articles of Confederation, to studying the Federalist Papers, to political spectrum surveys, um, elected officials tree, uh, studying Supreme Court cases, looking at our handbook and our code of conduct and comparing that to the Constitution, what rights do you have, how they, how they reflect, creating your own 28th Amendment. What would that look like? Talking about Title IX, doing online government research, primary source readings. The point is, we do a lot. To Mr. Martin's point, it is something that we care deeply about. And if we want to be able to um, address the issue and try to look at reasonable solutions, we are happy to do that. What is wrong with offering a standard government class? To Mr. Harrigan's point about the small numbers that take AP government, that's a reasonable solution without upsetting the whole schedule, without impacting choice for our students. We could do that. These are all things that we can continue to do. Just so you know, Poli Sci Club, UNICEF Club, Business Club, debate team, which by the way is advised by a member of our staff who is involved in his town government, GSA, Co, Multicultural Club, Student Council, all of these things are important avenues for students to apply civics education and hopefully they will take that with them if they get that opportunity. I know there are a lot of things I probably did not cover because it was covered tonight, but you know, I am happy to answer any questions because what I want to do is provide as much information as possible for our school committee to make the best decision they can possibly make. I just want all the facts to be out there. I want all the information to be out there. And if we're going to have a, an honest and open discussion, let's talk about reasonable solutions that can achieve our goals as a community and as a school. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, what I'd like to do is open this up to the board if they have any questions that they would like to have answered or any thoughts that came up during the night. I just do want to make note that um, as a committee, we do not have to come up with a decision on this this evening and come up with any vote on it. There was a lot of information given to us this evening. Um, questions may come to us tomorrow or I may get questions from anyone here or other constituents in town that may have a question a next day or so. So we're not looking to have any decision made this evening. So with that, I'll offer anybody on the board who has a question. I, I just make a statement. Um, Mr. Harrigan, I want to thank you. This has been an exercise in um, civil uh, uh, experience, more so than I've really had in a long time. We've had almost 100 people here tonight uh, engaged with passion, 
students um, who, who are, are, are thoughtful and present their case and um, really want to be involved, and that's what civics is all about. So thank you for bringing this forward, and it's been a worthwhile experience for me. Uh, you know, I appreciate the self-assessment of the staff and the administration. Um, that's worthwhile for us all to do occasionally, and it sounds like, um, from what I'm hearing, it's, it's, we're doing good things, and I know that already, but it's good for us to learn as a committee. We don't always get to get in the classrooms. We don't know what's going on on a daily basis, but to do this sort of assessment um, to see what we're actually doing for our students and, and how much they're getting out of, out of what we're teaching them is, is certainly worthwhile. Um, also, just as, again, acknowledge the students, we see how engaged and how civic-minded uh, some of our students are, and those that are passionate in it, in it have the opportunity because of the different uh, electives that we have, because of the staff that we have guiding them, um, to get involved and to be the best that they can be. And, and it's, it's amazing to see that, um, you know, both as a parent, but also as a, as a, as a, um, uh, a, a member of the community. And so I'm thankful for that today. Um, I just wanted to kind of sum it all together to see, are, are we confident, are we comfortable that all of our students understand how government works on a national level, on a state level, on a local level, things that they can do if they are interested in doing. Um, I know when I was in high school uh, a couple years back, I'm not even sure I knew there was a school committee. So I, I think we've come a long way since then, and I'm grateful for that. But but can you just kind of address the, our confidence? I know we, we discussed this certainly in eighth grade uh, and, and also embed it in some other things, but are we confident that our students have a, just a, a basic under, understanding of how our, how our national government works, how our state government works, how our local government works? Sure. So if you look at the entirety of the district, I am confident that they are well instructed in it. Now, I'm not, not going to speak in absolutes and say we know that every student remembers everything or knows everything, but we believe the instruction is very thorough. We do understand and realize that there are always things you can do to improve. As practitioners, that's what we do. We reflect. Our self-assessments do at the end of this month. Yeah. <laughs> so we reflect. And yes, you can always improve, but we are confident that we are providing a substantial amount of instruction in those areas, and our students should have a foundation and a, and a basis when they leave here. And I also wondered if, if um, you know, going forward, I know the staff is always willing to come to us, but um, after we uh, debrief from this self-assessment that this has forced us to do. Um, if you could come back to us, uh, you talked about reasonable solutions, yes. um, some things we might do going forward, um, you know, uh, to add a standalone course um, or to um, uh, put staff specifically to a civics class, certainly not something we're going to do this year um, or in the, who knows, in the years future, uh, going forward, but if we could have some sort of update uh, as, as you know, as you debrief from all of this, um, how we might be addressing some of those things and, and how this might create a little bit more change going forward. One thing I want to point out, and I know um, Ms. Anir uh, can speak to this way better than I could, but we're also waiting to see what the state of Massachusetts tells us in regards to civics education. So we have to be very careful and thoughtful um, in terms of redistributing the social studies curriculum because it might change, and then we have to change it all over again. And I think you've heard from our students, they're tired of all these changes. So we'd have to be really thoughtful of that piece. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting, you know, major changes, but just, you know, based on this whole conversation, um, some things that might come up from that. So. I think the Spartan block that Noah brought up, um, that's actually Noah, if you're still here. That was, oh, he, oh, he was? Yeah, he's here. Oh. So that was actually, um, we discussed that as a staff and um, some of our teachers that do the advisory, we talked about perhaps doing a voter registration offering to students if they're interested. So we have been talking about uh, building that capacity in some other opportunities at the high school. Yeah, um, I just want to uh, mention um, the five speakers that kind of, um, to me, kind of crystallized what we're talking about. The first speaker, Ms. Rader, obviously she set the tone. She talked about the scheduling and the uh, difficulty of adding required costs. That seemed to be a theme throughout with all the students. Um, the next speaker, the fourth speaker, Dr. Allen, was very eloquent in stating how uh, civics taught at the eighth grade level brings about deep discussions and the students fully apply 
what is being, what is happening in civics, especially at the eighth grade. Uh, then the second speaker, Mr. Malone, which I'm going to interpret, said that he felt high school was the appropriate time. I focus on that because I'm interpreting that Mr. Malone is saying civics should be taught at the high school, but he didn't say how. And then we heard from speaker number, what number was no, no, speaker number 19, who brought up an idea. He used the word compromise. And then we heard from speaker Ms. Wood, number 22, spoke about having a structured unit in your history too. So th that's where I'm at. And I know what my thought is, but it's too early to say it. But I go back to Mr. Harrigan and say, we were very specific up here. What we do from K right through to grade 12. From Mr. Harrigan, I heard he felt that it was important. The only specifics I heard was that we need a better appreciation of local government and the McKinnis American government. I need clarified as a school committee member, what are we not doing from Mr. Harrigan's point of view? Can I just say one really quick point? Um, oh. I did some research, and in the state of Connecticut, they do mandate civics for all mm -hmm. students. In the state of Massachusetts, they do not. Guess which state has the higher voter turnout? The state of Massachusetts. So again, hitting back that point that mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a civics class that's going to get the desired result of civic en engagement application. Uh, but I will say this, that the, when we were looking over the standards for social studies that are embedded in United States History 1 and 2, and we came up with that 88% number, that 12% that it seems to be missing, it's misleading because that focuses primarily on Massachusetts local government. And that's not to say that it is not embedded in U.S. History 1 and 2. As a former social studies teacher, and Eddie can speak about this as well, is that you use modern current events to hit home some of the highlights of historical concepts in history. So you can't have a history course where you're talking about, uh, you know, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists without making comparisons to what we have in place now and making comparisons to what we have at the state and local level. It's, it's always there. And I think uh, Ms. Ruger, her class, and I've, I've been in her class, where they do a lot of those discussions about the state and local level. Um, so I don't want you to give the impression that that 12 percent isn't covered because I think it is in many of our courses. Well, I, that, my point is I'm not sure exactly what Mr. Harrigan is asking of the school committee right now. I need that clarified, not at this moment, right. but as we move through in the process. And I just want to thank again everybody for the passion that they brought this evening and the enlightenment that at least I have been brought into tonight because I think we are hitting most of the points but I think we pop and to your point Eddie maybe we can do a little bit better but I would like to get some more information about what the options might be wary of what Desi could be coming out with as soon as December because to your point Dr. Flanagan we don't want to reinvent the wheel twice because this is a lot of work to Mr. Martin's point the scheduling and I'm concerned about this how the schedules have been up, the upheaval in the schedule process in the past couple of years. But the bottom line is it's all for the betterment of our students. We're never going to lose sight of the kids here because that's why we're all here. That's why we're all sitting at this table. That's why you sit where you sit. We're never going to lose sight of the kids, but I, don't, I think at this point we still need some more information. So, Mr. Fonseca, if I may, um, first I want to say that it is very evident to me after listening to our students and staff passionately talk about their viewpoints around this issue, why East Long Meadow Public Schools has had such a long history of being one of the best educational systems in this area. So that is first and foremost from our staff, yep. uh, both our teachers, our administrators, the student body, their, their uh, involvement in everything. I want to, I'm not, I had more to say, I'm, I'm going to just keep it to just a couple of few statements just because everything has already been said very well and right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any justice to it. What I do want to mention is that two things hit home a lot with me. Number one, regardless of what decision is made by the school committee regarding the situation, the student voice and choice is a very important part of the high school. It's part of the student's educational experience, and I would say a critical component to the culture in the high school. And it is one that should be valued, celebrated, and honored and protected. With that, any major curricular change that we make, we cannot do that, in my opinion, without considering the state's uh, direction. Right. Now, just to be clear, the state provides the base 
foundation. Everything we build, up, we go above and beyond that. However, to advise the committee to start to think about making a major curricular programmatic change prior to the standards being finalized or even in draft uh, format from the state would be ill-advised because we would continue to perpetuate this consistent and constant change that you heard our students talk right. against. So it would be um, my recommendation to the committee to think about if a change is to be made, that it's done in the timeline that the state is recommending, once they recommend the right. standards. If we decide at that point that there actually has to be a major change. Um, our curricular and program of studies selections and choices uh, follow the, the school committee's policy and procedures, um, and that's well vetted with the input of staff and, and through you know, central office personnel. So um, we will certainly, it, this has been a wonderful conversation and we can see what we are doing. We can see where we have ideas for improvement or enhancement of what we're currently doing. But as far as making a full curricular change or large revision, um, I just think we might be ahead. It's good to be ahead, but sometimes you might want more information oh. before you make it. No, that, I'm, that I'm in total fantastic. agreement. I'm not recommending any. I'm not even thinking no, about it. No, I'm just saying yeah. that if that would just be my uh, no. professional opinion would be to wait until we have some further information from the state. Oh, I agree. And, and again, to, to point out that I made, I'm concerned about the constant upheaval in the scheduling process because we can't lose sight of the kids and the stability that that brings. And I just want to also comment on Mr. Mark Maccarini. I think you really touched me tonight with the words that you had spoken that as adults, maybe we need to do better as our, you know, towards our children in terms of talking more about it at home and not just putting it as another requirement on the children, hoping that they can do better. It's also up to us as parents and as community members, as the adults, to really model. I mean, we have to model all the time in school and be the ones that the kids are going to look up to. And I think what you said tonight um, was very important for me to hear because I think that made a big impact on me that it's not just adding something to the students that, yes, we can actually change the schedule, but it comes down to, but is it necessary? And that's what I think we have to talk about also. And from everything I heard tonight, we we do so much that maybe it is, you know, the responsibility of the adult and the community as a whole to get out there and vote and be involved and be aware of what's going on. Okay. So with that, I ask any closing remarks? Okay. So I think what we will be doing at this point is closing the public hearing. We will take this under advisory. Um, if anyone will be interested, we will be bringing this up on our agenda at our next school committee meeting. So any discussion that we have with this will be an open session. Um, so we will keep the conversation going. This isn't a decision that's going to be made uh, overnight. I don't know. Do we have a time limit on that according to? We do have to the, reply to the, to, it, uh, to the petition within three months. Within three months. And if there were to be any changes, I can't see it coming in this school year. That would, it, again, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Thank you. would have to be considered for the next school year or maybe with what Mrs. Anir said in line with the um, state standards. And I also okay. just want to point out, again, just because it's being brought before school committee doesn't mean that we're not having um, discussions about right. it. We've learned a lot tonight. We've heard a lot from our parents and students, and right. it's a value. It's something that we value, and we're always looking for better ways to make sure our students are engaged in their community. Right. So I don't want you to think just because we're closing off tonight that we're not going to have those conversations right. either. I guess yeah. One of the best learning experiences, I think. Uh, Me too. In my yeah. Seven years. <laughs> yeah. It really, I just wanted to thank Mr. Harrigan for this opportunity to expose us all to this, to be the first to take on a petition through the new town charter. You know, we were all actively involved with the town government and the, ch you know, the change. So it was exciting to see this happen. And the amount of people that did come out tonight, you know, everyone has a lot going on on their schedule. So to even see this many people coming out, I s says volumes to me. And for people who came up to speak, and especially our students, it is not easy to get up in front and speak. So I do want to say thank you to everyone who came out tonight. And maybe this conversation will be the ripple change that we see spreading through our community. So with that. Um,
Move to close the public hearing. Okay, so we have a motion to close the public hearing, and it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed, nay. Okay, that move passes. To now we need to move to adjourn. Some move. And second, any for discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that carries forward, 5-0. With that, thank you, and have a great evening.